Now, today we have a very special lecture because it's a very special celebration today. The Tube's 150th birthday, as you probably all know, it's, it's actually flagged up on Google today. There are special stamps that have been ed edited. On January, 19, on January the 9th, 1863, the first train pulled out of Paddington Station to make its 3.5 mile maiden journey to Foundon, just near here. For the first six months, there were 25,000 passengers a day. There are now about 3.5 million on weekdays. But I'm sure our speaker, Oliver Green, will tell you a great deal more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Um, it's great to be back at Museum of London for this talk and a very uh, auspicious occasion. I hope it's auspicious anyway, the underground's birthday. Strictly speaking, not the tube, as you all know. We call it all the tube now, but the tube has only been around technically since uh, 1890, the deep level part. But it's nice to go right back to uh, the, the origins. And it's particularly appropriate because, and, and that we've started a bit early, because it's two minutes to one by my watch. now. Exactly at one o'clock uh, on 150 years ago, on the 9th of January, that very first train pulled out of Paddington uh, towards uh, Farringdon, just over the way, as you know. Now, the interesting thing, and this is a sort of repeating pattern, I think, about railways, probably in the underground in general, is that this was the train carrying all the special guests. And um, although even at that time, it wouldn't really have taken all that long and not more than half an hour to cover the uh, three and a half miles, as Valerie's mentioned, up to the edge of the city at Farringdon. But because it was a special occasion and because they were all special guests and they were going to get a big feast at the end, um, everyone was made to get out at every station to look at the <laughs> wonderful new surroundings. So in fact, I mean, what I'd originally thought was, well, by the time I get to the end of the lecture, I could say to you, and of course the train will have arrived by now, but actually it didn't, it took them about two hours and then <laughs> they spent most of the uh, early afternoon and, uh, and evening having a, a massive lunch I and mean, it's very city style thing isn't it um, and that, was, that went on for some time and it was only the next day that the general populace got to travel but they were all queuing up for that as everyone has been for, for this lecture and uh, what I'm going to talk about now is, is really the, the sort of I've called it the art of the underground, as you see, and that's not just art in the sense of the posters and everything else that we all love from the underground, but it's, it's a much broader art of the underground, which has been going on now for 150 years. And it's, about, it's partly about, I think, the way you create the infrastructure of a city and the way it specifically relates to London and the, the particularly interesting way in which that's happened in London over 150 years, some of which has been down to engineering, some of which has been down to finding the money, which has been a problem all the way along. Some of it has been artistic in the broadest sense in that I think the architecture has been at different periods amazing. There have been ups and downs of the underground. Um, but the nice thing is that, and when we get to the end, I, I'll confirm this, that we're actually on and up now and that's quite a good time to be talking about the history of the underground because only a few years ago, I mean, there were all sorts of problems and difficulties and uh, I'm glad I didn't have to take part in writing a 150-year celebratory book then when the future of the underground began to look a bit dicey. Anyway, I'll move on now to the, what will be, a, I hope, uh, visually entertaining. I'm not going to go into all the detail, I can't um, in, in the space of one lecture, but it's to give you a feel really for the way the underground has affected London dramatically over the last 150 years. And I'm surprised in many ways that that's not acknowledged more than it is. I mean, I expect all of you are, are great fans of London generally, I hope you are. I mean, I'm very passionate about the city and it's... Um, its entire history, of course, is very well shown in, in the museum above, which is where I started my museum career. The underground has become the sinews of the city. Frank Pick, who was the great um, underground managing director in the 1920s and who set the scene for the particularly high quality design style of the underground, always referred to London's transport system and the underground in particular as the framework of the town. 
And what he meant was, and, and he later on also said that London transport was, he believed, was an art. Uh, it was the art of creating a city for the future. And that's exactly what the underground has done. And in all the dozens of books about the history of London, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and which seem to come out with increasing um, regularity at the moment, I don't think that's ever quite been recognised. But the Underground Railway is more important to London's development in the last 150 years than anything else. And I think it's going to be the thing that um, holds London together for the future. So let's look back and see how it came back. And all the way, and this is another thing that fascinates me, the Underground, as you'll all be familiar with, you, you can go round it and you can see parts of the Underground that are like a, they're almost like an archaeological cross-section through modern London because there are still parts of the underground that look virtually as they did 150 years ago. And you can recognize other bits. Uh, it forms a sort of mosaic which supports the city. And that's not just the center of the city, but it's also created the suburbs. So in many ways, it's the absolutely essential glue and fiber that holds London together. And there's no place better to start that than Baker Street, which you see here. Uh, that's the lithograph of Baker Street 150 years ago, and that's Baker Street today on the Circle Iron platforms. Exactly the same. And one of the wonderful things about it, I think, is that even that original Victorian infrastructure was fantastically well built because it's exactly as it was now. And people are always saying, or some people always say, well, of course, the problem with the London Underground is it's the oldest and it's the, you know, it's just too old. It's not too old. I mean, it's still, the infrastructure still works very well indeed. And this northern part of the circle line uh, is still, as an infrastructure, it's never crumbled, it's never collapsed, it's never had to be majorly repaired. It still works. And we've always been good at doing that. And again, to contrast the then and now and future, this is the other end of the original line at Farringdon, which you'll all know, it's, it's only a 10 minutes walk over that direction. Um, Farringdon, uh, from very early on, and that picture at the top left there shows the station at the late 1860s, by which time the first connection with the uh, Metropolitan had already been built, which is now the Thameslink service. So that's the view looking towards the city with the Metropolitan behind the signal box there and a train which has probably come round on what is now the Thameslink Cross London line, uh, or possibly it's come uh, across from, uh, from Moorgate by then, because almost as soon as it had been built, the underground was being extended. There at the bottom left is the same uh, scene at Farringdon, but the other way, so that's looking out under the same roof which was built in the 1860s. And there on the right is the same um, view as top left, as it is today. And again, you can see London past, present and future there because there's the station which in five years time will have one of the crosslink, uh, the crossrail uh, stations underneath it. Um, it'll become a new transport hub for central London, but it's still got elements going right back to the 1860s. There beyond is St Paul's, of course, which was always the, the city, the centre of the city. The city was where the Metropolitan Railway wanted to get to. It's where everyone wanted to get to in the uh, Victorian period because it was already the business centre of London. And there beyond it, um, glimmering there, that's the Shard as it's going up, which again, as you know, it, that's part of London's future. The Shard is currently the tallest building in Europe. And that is now, or will be better linked in with the, the city on the other side of the river through new rail developments. Well, as you will know, the original Metropolitan Railway was not um, built by tube tunnelling, although everyone does now tend to say it's all but the tube is 150 years old. It's not, strictly speaking. It's uh, built by cut and cover construction. And there you see, top left, the... Um, seen at King's Cross, you can see King's Cross Station in the middle background there, uh, in about 1861, when they've just started construction of the Metropolitan. St Pancras isn't there, of course, because it was built a bit later, um, deliberately overshadowing King's Cross next door. But um, 
Even cut and cover construction was causing quite a lot of disruption. Of course, they had to close roads where it was being built. But when you think that um, the whole of that original section of the Metropolitan Railway, three and a half miles, built in three years, that's pretty good going, actually. Uh, and the disruption that we see in all the constructional photographs and images is no greater, really, than construction would be nowadays. So I think it was a fantastic achievement. Um, there you see King's Cross Metropolitan Station taking shape, top right. There it is, um, made a bit, lof bit loftier than it actually was, bottom left, once the train started running. Um, and even then, you can see in the construction, top right, that, and it's the sort of thing that Frank Peck looked back on in horror, the advertising merchants have been at work with posters, fly posters, all over the station, even before it's finished. Um, once it opened, it didn't originally have posters. That comes much later. Um, and it's always shown in those early uh, lithographs and illustrations as having an immensely genteel Victorian uh, middle-class passengers. But again, one of the great things about the Metropolitan is right from the start, everybody went on the Metropolitan and they had uh, the cheap workman's tickets as well, which were just coming in on some lines. That's one of the original uh, trains, which for the first two years, um, they used broad gauge Great Western trains, um, which linked up at Paddington. They can see one coming in bottom left. And that bottom right is one of those um, not quite the oldest stations, but that's Paddington. Um, the other Paddington station on the circle line bit, Parade Street, as it was originally known, which still has its original roof. So that's an example of where you can go back and see the original right now. Well, the Metropolitan and the district um, gradually uh, moved together to, um, to build the circle line. And this is another of these repeating thing. Amazing though it was that they built the Metropolitan Railway so quickly in the 1860s and then they started on a second underground, the Metropolitan District Railway, which was built along the new embankment. The idea was that these two separate companies would join their lines up uh, to create the circle line. And as is the way with big infrastructure projects, it doesn't always go quite smoothly. It was very expensive to do. The chairman of the two companies didn't get on. And it was 21 years before they actually completed the circle line. So we got very early into that rhythm whereby big projects actually end up taking much longer than you think, costing much more than you think, not always getting the political support that you want. Um, and that, that's the view of London and its various railways, but with the, uh, the underground parts shaded in red there, as they were by about 1890. Um, and you can see that London is already covered in railways. Railways are having a big impact. But there's nothing right in the centre within the circle line. And the next big step is to go deeper. And this is the beginning of the tube. Uh, the first tube line, um, what is now parts of the northern line, was the City and South London Railway. Again, they wanted to get to the city, but it's built at deep level um, from Stockwell up to the city and opened in 1890. And it's built using the then uh, newly developed technology of using a shield tunneling. That's one of the early Great Head Shields, top left. And this was a way of, it was the way all the tubes were constructed originally. You had this circular um, protection with a cutting edge behind where that guy's standing there. And um, men would, uh, you could get two or three miners inside the protection of the shield, they would dig out the clay, and London clay is very good for easy tunnelling, shovel it back, it would be taken back, and then an another bunch of guys would um, create the tube by bolting together these curved segments of cast iron, and now it's done in the same way, but with machines and with concrete lining. Um, gradually burrowing your way through. And of course, you all these rings, put them together, and you've got a tube, hence the name. And by the time the third tube had opened, which was the Central London Railway on the right there, uh, known as the Tuckney Tube in those days because of the flat fare, um, you had uh, a tube railway going right under Central London for the first time. 
Uh, this is the middle bit of the central line, which of course serves both the city and the business end and the, um, the leisure end, if you like, of the West End. So it serves shops and um, the great department stores that were just opening uh, along Oxford Street and it runs the whole length of Oxford Street. And it had to be advertised. This is where poster advertising begins, because although it was a great technical construction, people had to be persuaded to use the tube. Um, it was a bit frightening at that time. It must have seemed like science fiction, really, to be going down in electric lifts and then whizzed under uh, London at high speed by electricity. And electricity, of course, is the key to all this, because you couldn't have built the tube still using the old technology of steam uh, because the steam could, simply couldn't escape. So everything that took place at the beginning of the 20th century was really driven by this magical new um, system of electricity. And it very quickly became more than simply a rather basic uh, engineering. Bottom left there, you see the original uh, tube at, at Stockwell Station, and it's pretty bleak. And actually, this was very experimental at that stage. It's got wooden platforms. It has little locomotives to pull the trains, and they're not very powerful. The power station was not big enough. They couldn't generate enough power, although everyone was very excited about it. They actually charged people uh, to go and see the power station. It was that exciting. People at like HG Wells, who were all overwhelmed by new electrical facilities, when, and Wells actually wrote a special, uh, rather gruesome story called The Lord of the Dynamos, having been to see the new tubes um, power units. But actually the power was, it was still a bit uh, low and they actually had to put in a new generator because the electricity was only just enough to power a couple of trains. The lighting was gas. The um, original lifts on the uh, city in South London were actually um, water driven by um, uh, hydraulic power. So the next stage, the central London, which is a, a much grander affair, um, would actually promoted itself much better. And, um, but they still clearly felt that they had to give you a kind of, it's like those old Rupert Bear annuals, isn't it? Where, you know, you get a picture showing you what you have to do as you go through things. And top left there, you come to the station, go in, you buy your ticket, you go over to the man, you give him the ticket, um, you go through, somebody takes you down in the lift in the middle there, and then someone shepherds you onto the train, and then finally you get to your destination. <laughs> but they were very anxious to persuade everyone that this was perfectly safe, it was quick, it was easy, it was cheap. I mean, advertising standards didn't come into it in those days, but you can see what they were getting at. And the next stage, just a few years later, uh, were the, the next three tubes that were opened by... Uh, an American-based or American-created company, the Underground Electric Railways of London, which becomes the basis of the whole thing. And their stations on their three lines were all much the same. Uh, but this is, um, because it was American-driven, this is really Chicago comes to London. And this changed the nature of the Underground Railway dramatically. Um, it was a company chaired by a fraudster called um, Charles Tyson Yerkes, who came from Chicago where he'd made a lot of money electrifying and cre uh, creating the elevated uh, railways in Chicago. And a lot of this was driven by American technology. Yerkes was also a very good salesman. He persuaded people in London that if they helped finance his new company, he could pay for these three new lines and everyone would make money out of it. Of course, it never happened like that. But even today, people seem to think that actually, if private money goes into building underground lines or even railway lines, they'll make a profit. They never do. It just doesn't work like that. But people never seem to learn from history, do they? But what um, Yerkes the Fraudster did create for London was this wonderful new system. And it was um, highly engineered. I mean, a lot of it using American technology. Um, all driven from this enormous new power station at um, Chelsea, Lots Road, which has only just stopped um, providing all the power for the whole of the London Underground system for 100 years. And the station designs were all very modern for the time. They're all actually on load-bearing steel frames, which again is a bit of Chicago technology. It's the basis of skyscraper construction, really. 
And they were designed that way so that they could take the weight of the lift motors and lots of stories above if necessary. So, and then they were de decorated and clothed in the most fashionable style, which was, of course, Art Nouveau at the time. So those are just a few examples. That's the Leslie Green, the original uh, designer of these stations. That's his original sketch of Oxford Circus, top left, that watercolour. And these are the features that uh, you can still see at some of his surviving stations. Um, that top right is Mornington Crescent, bottom right, Elephant Castle, bottom left, uh, what was originally called Gillespie Road. Um, that was the only case on the entire underground where a football company managed to persuade London's Underground to change the name of the station. As you'll know, when Arsenal were top club in the 30s, um, they persuaded them to change the name. It's, it's been called Arsenal ever since. The other ones don't count, of course. West Ham is in West Ham. It's nothing to do with the football club. Well, again, moving on, the, the underground electric railways had bought, also bought out the old district, electrified that, and they gradually began to pull together uh, the basis of the modern underground. And in some cases, you can see the old and new together uh, to this day. Um, Gloucester Road Station, uh, which you see top right after it's just been completed for the district railway in the 1860s. And there's the same station today on the right-hand side. That's the district part of Gloucester Road. And on the left, you can see the Leslie Green's addition for the Piccadilly line, which, of course, is right below the district at um, Gloucester Road. And the same happened at uh, South Kensington, bottom left. And again, Fairly early on, and this is when Frank Peck comes into the picture, uh, as publicity officer for the Underground Electric Railways, Peck commissioned new lettering from uh, Edward Johnston, and uh, he got Edward Johnston to also combine his lettering eventually with uh, the original um, symbol of the Underground, uh, which became that bar and circle. And again, you can still see they're often reconstructed now, as they originally were, but that's uh, Temple Station, top left, um, with the old-style uh, underground roundel. Out in the suburbs, the Metropolitan, which was not part of the same uh, organisation at this stage, was slightly doing its own thing, but gradually improving its system, and it built a new um, country line, which was just like an overground railway, really. The bit of the Metropolitan that extended way out to... Harrow and beyond by this stage, but it built a new branch line from Harrow to Uxbridge. And again, they hadn't quite caught up with the new technology. When it opened in 1904, they had to use steam trains for the first six months because their new electric system was not quite ready. But um, it was after a while, and both on the Metropolitan and on the district, which had been electrified by the Americans, you got from the beginning of the 20th century very American-style trains as well. And that um, train up top right, the original trains, you can see the influence of American styling very much there. I mean, they look like the trains that you see in cowboy films, don't they, with a clear story roof, except they're electric. Um, and all the undergrounds in 1908, the, even though they're, they're a series of separate companies at this stage still, but at least they all agreed that they ought to get their marketing act together because all of them suffered from this problem. They'd invested in building the new lines, they'd invested in electrification, and they weren't getting enough passengers. So um, Frank Pick and colleagues devised the first free underground map, and that's it. And this new lettering, which was put up out, uh, uh, above all the stations to show that whoever owned it, it was all part of the underground. It gave the notion of an entire networked system. And by the First World War, the underground were feeling so pleased with themselves, really, because they recovered through all this from potential bankruptcy at the time that Yerkes left them this system. Yerkes had died, incidentally, in 1905, just before all the new tubes opened. And the man who was appointed uh, in charge was uh, a man called Albert Stanley, who was uh, English-born but American-trained, he came to London uh, on the advice of the American people who were involved in setting up the underground group to turn around this problem because they were worried that the whole thing was going to go belly up when it opened. They just were going to um, get bankrupt. And Stanley was interesting because what he did was he 
actually invested in the underground then. He managed to get the money from other means and negotiate mergers. He was a, a very strategic character. He eventually became Lord Ashfield and was to become the first chairman of uh, London Transport in the 30s. His right-hand man was Frank Pick, who at this stage was still doing the publicity, but making a fantastic job of it and promoting the underground in a way that the old-fashioned railways just had never quite done. So it was an interesting combination of sort of forward thinking, American technology, and a, a, almost American-style marketing techniques. Um, and by 1915, this, this is just a, a sample of one of the, the publications that Pick organized. It's a children's alphabet, which is full of uh, these lovely little poems and uh, things of the underground. But there, I mean, I think that says it all, really. You is the underground pride of the nation, triumph of science and civilization. And they, they clearly believed that at the time. And by the 20s, uh, although the, the metropolitan was still staying independent of the um, underground electric railways, but both of them were expanding out into the suburbs and they were really pioneering suburbia. Uh, and in the, in the Metropolitan's case, of course, they, they came up with this snappy title, Metroland. Um, they launched Metroland actually during the First World War, which doesn't seem like the best time to do it, you wouldn't think. But um, by the 20s, it really took off. And Metroland was, was initially a sort of promotion supposedly to encourage people just to come out and walk and uh, go out for the day. And, of course, rambling was very popular in the 20s. But what they were really after was getting a captive market of season ticket holders who would actually live in Metroland in the new property developments. And, of course, London's, London's outer areas really took off in the 20s. The, the house building was a, a fantastic rate, sort of thing that, you know, sadly, we just can't manage today. But um, London was expanding and it was served, of course, directly by the underground. So the underground was key to London developing in this way and spreading out over a large area in a quite different way to cities like Paris, which are still actually quite tightly knit. Uh, and of course, the metro in Paris, if you look at the maps, it doesn't actually go much beyond the traditional limits of Paris. It goes to all of the, uh, the gates, the old gates of the city. But London, it was quite different. It was integral to London's creation as a, a large, as greater London, the suburban city uh, in the 1920s. And meanwhile, they were also at work um, creating new things under the centre. Um, the line which had opened in 1890, the original city in South London, actually needed upgrading fairly quickly. It was completely inadequate. And so as part of the developments in the 20s, they not only extended out into the suburbs overground, but they actually rebuilt half what was already there underground. And there is the, uh, again, one of the posters that Pick commissioned, and he was very good at doing this. I mean, the, the publicity for the underground was fantastic in the 1920s. And although it wasn't, uh, it wasn't deceptive, really, I mean, London really was improving and they achieved a great deal, but he managed to do it to make the engineering, which, which was behind all this, an exciting thing. And London became, you know, this um, dramatic city driven by the new technology, beautifully engineered and artistically advertised. Um, that's... Um, comparison there between the ghostly old train on the right and the new tube trains and of course the trains as well were fantastic designs miles in advance of anything on the mainline railways which at the time were nearly all still traditional Victorian style slam door trains with steam locomotives most of them and the underground had got pneumatic um, driven doors and um, it was just, you know, it, it seemed like the future, must have felt like that uh, at the time. And out in the suburbs, they were creating a new lifestyle, really. And this, I love this picture. But it's a sort of typical scene of suburbia in the third, uh, late 20s, actually. Um, presumably on a Saturday, there you have in the middle, um, everyone in those days, of course, used to work Saturday mornings at least, but they all came home from the office. Um, to go off into their uh, suburban dream homes. And there we have two guys in the middle, one of whom has already changed into his cricket whites on the left, They're carrying their cricket bag. The guy on the right is still in his office clothes and bowler hat, but they're obviously off to play cricket on Saturday afternoon. Over on the right-hand side there, you can see 
Um, Mummy has brought Junior along and she's carrying him to come and meet Daddy off the train and other people are going to take the buses uh, and there's the 142, which I think still runs from Edgware, um, going off into the outer suburbs and the underground had created this sort of mixed transport system. The underground had, through Stanley, Albert Stanley, he'd bought up the London General Omnibus Company, and so they were beginning to integrate the services. So the buses fed the tubes, and the whole thing was, as I say, creating a new life in the suburbs for a lot of people. And then PIC started looking more at uh, not just the publicity, but the, the physical infrastructure. And he was passionate about the, this looking fantastic. And he and Charles Holden, the architect created this wonderful partnership, starting with the extension of the, uh, the northern line the other way. They built the line out to Edgware, which we saw just there. Then they built the, the line down uh, south to Morden. They reconstructed it all in the middle. So they created this wonderful spinal tube, which uh, they didn't call it the northern line at the time. I'm never quite sure why not. It was called the northern line from 1937. Um, but this was the beginning of really the underground in a very obvious way affecting the look of the whole city, which again was exactly what Frank Pitt wanted to do. And Holden came up with a, um, a whole new architecture really for transport and for the underground in particular in London, which was unlike anything anyone had ever done before anywhere else. Um, Pitt wanted something which wasn't quite like what Leslie Green had done before the First World War for those original tube stations, which did look distinctive, but they had their disadvantages. They weren't, as Pick saw it, they weren't really fit for purpose. Um, the colour, that ruby red colour, was, was okay during the daytime, but at night it began to just look black. By the 20s, when, again, new technology was, was helping them, um, floodlighting was, had come in, and these stations on the northern line, running down from Clapham to Morden, are all designed on the same principle. They are a sort of folding screen, and they're lit above they're through daylight during the daytime. You plonk the underground roundel in the middle. The thing is backlit as well at night. Um, and outside, they place, and you can just see the modern ones there above the, uh, the name, there are floodlights underneath. So the whole station, and it was created in Portland stone, so it was white. It was all along uh, what was essentially an Ed Edwardian and Victorian red brick um, street. But the stations shone out like little gems day and night and advertised the tube fantastically. And as Pitt wanted it to be, they were a sort of welcoming beam in the night, really, as well. Um, and so there we have uh, the new architect. He, he said to his friends in the Design and Industry Association, we want to represent the DIA gone mad, and I've got Holden along to see that we go mad in good company. And they did, and they created, and everyone said at the time, this is the most fantastic new architecture for London. Having done that, um, Holden was given a much bigger job right in the centre of London because the next project, there are two prestige projects for the underground by the end of the 20s, one of which is to rebuild and enlarge Piccadilly Circus, which of course is met metaphorically and literally at the heart of London. And what Holden did was he transformed what could have been just an engineer's hole in the ground underneath the original Piccadilly Circus into this wonderfully inviting new um, centre of London, which even if you didn't go on the, on the tube down the uh, new escalators to below, even if you just walked round what Holden called the ambulatory, round the outside, you had shop windows around there, and it was created to look like the posh shopping streets above. So this was sort of Regent Street reproduced um, on the underground below. And you could, of course, cross uh, and avoid the weather and the traffic, uh, even if you didn't go on the tube. And on the way, you could look at the showcase of Swan and Edgar's upstairs, uh, which had just been rebuilt itself. And that's a postcard from about 1930, showing the wonders of the new Piccadilly Circus station, which you can still see today, of course. Um, even that wonderful uh, map 
uh, top left there, there's a, a moving map, uh, which you may have seen at Piccadilly Circus, within that rotunda, which shows you the time in Montevideo and all sorts of odd things like that. And originally, the escalators at the middle had a huge mural over them, which was a sort of world map. Uh, and also a series of things of uh, paintings of other parts of London and the things you could get to on the underground. The map had everything homing in from around the world on London, centre of the universe, centre of the British Empire. It was, uh, and everyone came, and so it seemed like you know the, the next wonder of the world, really. And um, the people who were particularly impressed actually were the Russians. Um, they sent a delegation of engineers over and to see this new station because they were planning to build a, a metro for Moscow. And the engineers were so impressed, particularly by the escalators, which they'd never seen uh, in the Soviet Union. They only had elevators. And um, they reported back to their, their boss who was managing on Stalin's behalf the development of the Moscow metro. Uh, it was Khrushchev who, of course, later became in charge himself. And Khrushchev then persuaded Stalin that what they had to have for Moscow was what London had got, this fantastic underground transport system which used the latest things, it used escalators going down in the middle uh, instead of lifts, which they were used to, and it was built in the most aristocratic, posh part of town. And what he wanted to do, and which they achieved in many ways, was to do the same thing but on a grander scale, so that we communists can do it just as well as those capitalists in London. And they actually, the Russians actually got the London Underground to um, do a report for them. And this was the big, and um, Pick supervisors, he sent engineers over to look at the problems. And um, the Moscow Metro, although it, it is bigger, of course, it's grander in many ways than the London one, but it's based on uh, what we'd done in London. And the consultancy report that was done for London under, by London Underground for the Russians was the beginning of what later became London Transport International. It was where the British, the Underground in particular, advised other people on how to build their metros. And at the end of the 30s, Frank Pick actually received the only public decoration he ever got was the Order of Lenin, which he got from the <laughs> Russians. <laughs> Sad but true. He ought to be much better known. Well, what Pick also commissioned from Holden at much the same time as Piccadilly was uh, a new headquarters for the underground. It was a growing company. It needed a new headquarters for its administrative staff. And they decided to build it on the property that they already owned, which was St. James's Park Station. So Holden came up with this brilliant um, plan to straddle uh, an existing underground station at St. James's Park and on a very difficult triangular site. And he created um, what has always been known as 55 Broadway, uh, the still the underground headquarters today. And at the time, essentially, it was the first skyscraper in London. There were no tall buildings in London then, and the LCC building regulations were very strict about that. Um, this, when it opened in Ice 29, was the tallest building in Westminster. In fact, it was so tall that the top floor, the LCC wouldn't let the staff use it for some years until they changed the regulations. But it's, it's essentially, it's, Holden came up with this combination of almost American-style design. So it's stepped up to the tower at the top. Um, and it also has a walkway through at the bottom, which invites you into the underground station. It's been slightly amended over the years, so you can't, you have to go sort of round the foyer now, but um, created really a very artistic building, which was modern, but also in some ways quite traditional. It's built on a steel frame, but it's got Portland stone cladding, and Holden, who was very keen on, like Pick, on, on using um, artist designers, he actually had sculptures put on the outside of it, which were a little controversial, some of them at the time. The upper sculptures, which were a bit wasted because they're too high, really. You can't see them without binoculars. But they were, amongst others, um, Eric Gill created some of those, um, who was becoming well-known at that time. And it was the first example of a public sculpture by Henry Moore, also up there. But the ones that created all the trouble were the two uh, that you could see from the street very well, and still can, by Jacob Epstein, which uh, were figures representing night and day. Uh, and Epstein, even though he'd been designing uh, 
sculptures for over 20 years, he was still a bit of a controversial figure and there was a huge fuss about these um, sculptures when they were unveiled and the popular press, the son of the day, would, were saying that it was, uh, you know, they were uh, obscene, disgusting, primitive, whatever, and people threw paint over them. There was a huge fuss and Frank Pick actually offered to resign but didn't uh, uh, over the, the fuss. Nowadays, of course, nobody gives them a second look, which is sad because they're, they're rather nice. But they then went on, Holden again was designing the new stations for the Piccadilly line, which are often reckoned to be his best. So this partnership of the managing director of the underground, Frank Pick, and um, his architect actually created, well, I think uh, probably the best bits of commercial architecture in London um, from the 1930s. And of course, they're all listed buildings today. And they've been very nicely restored, most of them. It must have been extraordinary at the time to have something like that flying saucer at Southgate descending into the middle of what was then still a sort of village just outside London. But the underground were very proud of these, not surprisingly, and actually some of the posters did advertise the stations rather than the destinations. Here you are, come and see the latest in railway architecture, which it was. And some of those features, again, you can still go and see them. That wonderful Art Deco light there is at Bounds Green. That's Arnus Grove, bottom right, and Southgate, top right. And of course, the thing that, um, again, from the early 30s, that's become, I suppose, the, uh, the most revered symbol of, of London's underground and transport system, the, uh, the famous Harry Beck map, which is slightly odd in a way, although it is, it's part, in a sense, of this artistic design of the city, uh, and the way it's represented. And it's now held up as a classic of graphic design, which it is. But the interesting thing about it is it wasn't actually commissioned by the underground, as is now well known. I mean, Harry Beck, who actually worked for the underground, as, and he was a draftsman, he, it was like a staff suggestion, really. He came up with this idea of changing the geographical map into a, what's technically a, a diagram. It's not a map at all. And because it was getting more and more difficult to put the whole thing, this enormous system, on one little folding pocket map, um, he, he shrunk the outer areas uh, and enlarged the centre and colour-coded the whole thing. Everything is on a vertical, diagonal or uh, horizontal. And the underground were a bit worried, actually, when he kept badgering them to try this out, and they agreed in the end. And, uh, the reaction was just amazing from the public. Uh, they put a little timid notice on it saying, uh, this is a new design for our map. Um, we would welcome your comments. And people thought it was amazing. And of course, they've stuck with it ever since. And as, as you know, I mean, any attempts to change the map, even though it's very well designed to incorporate more and more extensions, but you may recall a couple of years ago that um, they decided in order to get more things in, they'd take the river off and all hell broke loose. <laughs> and the mayor had to um, say, the next map will have the river back, which it did. So if any of you got that, the, there is a map which came out at that time. It'll be a, a classic of the future, the underground map without the Thames. And the whole look, the sort of corporate design of the underground is seen by the 30s all over London. And it's reflected in the, the graphic design, in the posters, the use of the symbol, the use of the lettering, and the very distinctive, and yet actually not boring, architecture. Holden used to call these stations brick boxes with concrete lids, but I mean, that makes them sound dull. They're not dull, they're fantastic bits of modern architecture, which also have a respect for uh, English tradition. So they're sort of European modernism, plus um, the arts and crafts <laughs> molded together. And those are two at the western end of the Piccadilly. That's Boston Manor, top left, and that's Rainer's Lane. Um, and underground, they were doing more to make what, what was already a great piece of engineering into something which looked good as well. Um, these are the escalators, one of the few um, sets of escalators where the original uplighters designed by Holden uh, survive. That's St. John's Wood. Um, they have them at Southgate as well. And the only other one, I think, is the exhibition exits at Earl's Court, which have now been closed. And so that's presumably going to go. 
Uh, and there's the upstairs, top right there, as it was in, in 1939, when uh, the new uh, station on this further extension, this time of the Bakerloo, what's now part of the Jubilee Line, was created. Well, the underground kept expanding in the 30s, and at that time, they, had, they were using um, treasury guarantees against the money. They were allowed to, I mean, they, in the 20s, they'd still been a private company, but effectively, they were beginning to be sort of subsidized by the state because the treasury gave them financial guarantees, and the government were, were happy to do that because they didn't have to pay extra money, but it was a way of... Um, without actually subsidizing the underground, a way of getting the new work done. And it had the advantage of, it created jobs, and it was a time of unemployment. It also helped to stimulate the wider economy because they needed steel and everything else to do it. So you, you almost got a sort of virtuous circle with the extension of the underground. And I find it interesting that we're now back to that exact situation where the, the, the current government are not surprisingly, getting very keen on infrastructure projects again. And we've been there before. This is what happened in the 1920s. And I don't quite understand why it doesn't happen again in, in the same sort of way of financing it. You don't necessarily have to do it by the government underwriting the whole lot and it costing a lot of money. But um, the underground and then London Transport proceeded at, at astonishing pace to create this new extended infrastructure for London. Uh, part of the project, the new works program in the 30s, was to extend both the Bakerloo and the Northern Line. The Northern Line eventually came to the surface and joined up with one of the old steam railways uh, at East Finchley. And they, they created a, a wonderful station, which is still, it's one of my favorites, on the underground at East Finchley, uh, with this um, Art Deco archer speeding the trains to central London. That's uh, Erica Monnier's design, which is still there. And I think it's even been adopted as, a, it's a kind of symbol of that part of North London now. Um, but unfortunately, the war broke out and um, the new works program was not completed. Uh, and of course, the underground turned to other uses which had never been intended, uh, like um, pe people um, sheltering on the tube during the Blitz. Um, Highgate Station had just been completed uh, at the, the time that the uh, war broke out and it was used for a while um, just for uh, shelters before it was even opened. And up on the surface, if you go to Highgate today, you can see above the tube station, which is bottom left, is the remains of what would have been Highgate High Level Station, where there would have been connections to a new, uh, to an electrified um, version of the old steam line which went one way back to Finsbury Park and the other way up to Ali Pali. And sadly, that never happened. Um, and it's, it's a kind of example of what's happened since the war, really, um, particularly in the 50s. London Transport had gone through this wonderful period of expansion and development in the 30s. Uh, Frank Pick left the company in the early part of the war, and he died during the war. Lord Ashfield, um, the former Albert Stanley, only just survived the war himself. He died just at the point when the new Labour government after the war nationalised the whole of the railway system. And probably unfortunately, I think, they included London Transport in that. London Transport was swallowed up in this new monolith called the British Transport Commission. And from then onwards, there was no plan for transport really at all in this country. And there never has been ever since, not only in London, but in, on the main line railways. And the underground just, just about managed to complete some of the things that they'd started before the war. So Bethnal Green Station, which has just been refurbished and which had been used throughout the war as a shelter uh, for shelters, it's just been refurbished. And it's one of the last examples of some of those wonderful decorative features like that fantastic roundel clock there. Um, the one at top right is Gantz Hill, which is always said to be a sort of... Um, it's almost a nod back to what the Moscow Metro had done in the 30s, which in turn had come from London. And Gantz Hill has this um, great hall in the middle and the, the platforms are on either side. Um, it's much smaller than the way they do it in Moscow, I have to say. And the Moscow ones are double-ended stations 
uh, which was not really necessary for Ghent's Hill and was never installed. But um, it's still quite an impressive station and has been improved. But further out and bottom left there, you can see when the tube trains finally got as far as Loughton uh, just after the war. But beyond there for, for a while and right up into the 50s, there were still steam trains running on these former branch lines. And the very last bit out to, from Epping to Ongar was only electrified uh, in the mid 50s. And then it was closed at the end of the uh, 1990s. Um, but you can go back there now, and it's just been re revitalised as a heritage railway, actually, no longer part of the London Underground. Well, we're almost coming up to date now. Um, I'm just checking my, my watch to, on our timing here. Uh, but everything slowed down, really, in the 50s. And, I mean, to be fair, the country had other priorities than uh, London's transport at the time. And so the resources, which, of course, were in an age of austerity, tended to go into other things like housing um, and the new National Health Service. And the underground spent virtually no money on capital projects throughout the 50s. Finally, right at the end and at the beginning of the 60s, they did what they'd always planned to do back in the 30s, which was to electrify the Metropolitan Line all the way out to Amersham. There were still steam trains on the outer bits of the Met right through the 50s. Uh, and then finally, they were replaced in 1961 by new electric trains, which you see top right there. Um, and those trains, as you may know if you use that line, have only just been replaced again uh, by these new uh, fully air-conditioned trains, the S-Stock, uh, on the Metropolitan Line. So those um, modern trains, as they were in the uh, early 60s, have just gone um, and been replaced by those at the bottom right. So again, we're, we're gradually now getting back to doing something new, but London Underground, like a lot of organisations in this country, I think, got into a, a rather an odd cycle after the um, Second World War, whereby new plans would be drawn up, but then characteristically it would take at least 20 years for the government to agree to fund it and for the thing to actually be built. And that's what's happened ever since the war. In the late 40s, they planned a new tube line across central London. It opened 20 years later as the Victoria Line. Uh, and then you get on to, let's just mention the Victoria Line. But it took, um, it took a lot of persuading of government to actually uh, go for that. And they, they just didn't see an essential need to invest at that time. And to be fair, I suppose London's population was not growing as fast. In fact, it was declining a bit in the 50s. And so there wasn't the current problem of intense overcrowding. But the Victoria Line, although it was built in the period of uh, Harold Wilson's white heat of technology, and it was technically pretty advanced. It was the first automatic computer-controlled underground railway in the world. But this was the last time that the London Underground was ahead of the game internationally because it was, although London Transport were using the best of their technology at the time, and it was an ingenious system, and it was the beginning of automatic ticket control and everything else, they had to build it to a very tight budget. And the Victoria Line, you can sense this today, the Victoria Line, the tiles started falling off the walls virtually as soon as it opened. It just was not built to the standards that London Underground had been proud of um, before the war. And that was partly because they hadn't got the money to spend. So the engineering was good, but the actual carrying out of the job was not quite. Um, and even now, uh, I think it, in design terms, it's also, it's very characteristic of the 60s, but it's, it looks a bit bleak, really, and it's only relieved by some of the last remnants of uh, architectural design in those little tile panels at each station, which are rather nice, but they don't, the rest of the station is sort of grey and uh, a bit grim. But then we get into this cycle again. It's another, um, first it's another 10 years before the next line is started, which is the uh, Jubilee line. But of course, as you'll know, the Jubilee line was only a really short stub end bit. Most of it was actually just renaming an old line, which was the Bakerloo line. Um, and when the original bit opened in 1979, um, they didn't get all the way through to Docklands, which um, 
was part of the original plan. It took another 20 years for that to be built. But uh, having said that, this was when London was beginning to come up again. Having, and the underground, having reached this real low point, probably in the 80s, and the worst possible thing, which uh, you'll remember, was the, the King's Cross fire in 1987. Terrible disaster. But it was actually a disaster waiting to happen because the underground had just not had the resources and the money to do the, the running repairs and to replace equipment. And it was caused largely by an, an old escalator, if you remember, Somebody had dropped a cigarette on it, and we still had only just uh, banned smoking on the underground at that point, which, looking back, seems amazing, really. You can't believe that it was ever allowed, but it was. And, um, but ever since that, that fire, I mean, what London Underground had to do, and w they had to get the money for it as well, was to create a what the managing director in the 90s, Dennis Tunnicliffe, used to call uh, a properly fit metro. And... That's what they created with the new Jubilee line. And so suddenly we're back to that quality design of everything uh, which was applied to the Jubilee line extension in the 90s. And meanwhile, the rest of the system is being cleaned up, upgraded. It's got new safety systems. And although people sometimes say, to my amazement, why is the underground so dirty? It's not dirty. It's pin clean these days. If you remember what it was like in the 80s when there was rubbish everywhere, there was graffiti everywhere, it felt threatening. It's not like that at all anymore. The problem now is it's just a, bit, a little bit too overcrowded. Um, but that's the latest problem that we've all got to deal with. And this is, this is my last slide. Um, and I haven't had time to mention people really at all. And the gentlemen here, uh, I'm, I'm not picking on them, honestly. But um, this goes back to the thing that I've mentioned, that what we really need, I think, for London, and what, what perhaps we're getting back to now, is there ought to be a plan for the future. The problem that we've had in this country, and it's both on the underground and on the main line railways ever since the Second World War, is that there hasn't been a plan. We've never had a transport plan, and we really need that. And that's why I think this talk now about infrastructure needs, needs to come back. The trouble is that politicians inevitably don't think beyond the next election, and that's something we've suffered from ever since 1945. That photograph top left is, I always rather like, because it's... it's possibly the beginning of a sort of coming together across the parties of thinking on transport. And it was taken three years ago, and it shows Gordon Brown, of course, in the centre, uh, Boris on the left. Um, Gordon Brown was Prime Minister then, but he had had an involvement, in a sense, with the underground uh, before, because when he was Chancellor, it was under his watch that Labour, surprisingly, came up with this disastrous private-public partnership scheme which all went belly up in the end. Um, that's the wonderfully named Lord Adonis on the right there, who was Transport Minister for a while. Um, what they're looking at, the three of them, is they're at a launch event for Crossrail, which, of course, is, is now underway, the biggest infrastructure project in Europe, which finally, after, and again, it's the usual thing, it's been planned for 20 years. We're finally building it now. And... Um, and these guys are all part of the um, decision-making process, but, but they move on. And, of course, fortunately, the private-public partnership has now been buried and everyone's forgotten about it. But it cost a fortune to do that, mainly in lawyers' fees. Um, but even before it, you know, anything new was started. But we're now, ironically, back in a situation where Boris, as mayor, is actually, in effect we renationalised the London Underground because it's all controlled centrally. It's not split up into this ridiculous system of having contractors doing some bits, uh, which didn't work out cheaper or better. Uh, and we now have an integrated system again. And, and, and Boris, to his credit, uh, and Ken before him, both of them pushed very hard to, to get the money for new investment, both in the Underground and on what effectively is the next Underground, the Crossrail scheme, which uh, people are busy, um, virtually under our feet, digging away at now. And that on the right there is, it's, uh, it's one of these um, computer-generated artistic visions, but uh, that's what Canary Wharf Crossrail Station 
may look like in five years' time if it's all on time. But I, I do find that quite exciting that this is all happening now and sort of relieved that it is going forward, but um, slightly worried as to whether you know, each of the new things will actually happen and when it will happen and whether I'll still be alive to see it. But I think you know, the, the sort of the vision of Frank Pick that the transport system can actually help to create and stimulate the town is happening again now and London just in the last 15 years 20 years has been transformed really by all sorts of projects but many of them linked to the transport system which are really redesigning and that's why I called it the art of the underground where we're redesigning the public realm in London and the transport system is an essential part of that and it's all as Lon um, Frank Pick Set of London Transport, it is an artwork, really. And uh, I think it's going to be something that we're, we'll all feel very proud of. But we're always a bit uncertain, aren't we? I and mean, it's like the Olympics. We all thought, well, we're not going to be able to manage it. And actually, it was fantastic. And the transport system was, was very central to that. Um, and so, you know, design and planning is all coming back into the public realm now. And it's, it's going to be good. I think. So, I'll leave you with that and I hope that in five years' time I can come back and tell you about Crossrail and that we'll all be travelling across London on that. So, thank you very much.